Hello and welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer, and joining me is a man that bought a Swiss Army knife after watching Hard Rain. It's Eric Hoffmeyer. Well, I skipped the Swiss Army knife and I went straight to multi tool. Why settle with the Swiss Army knife when you can have like a proper Gerber multi tool with actual tools on it? Now, do you have it in a leather pouch on your belt? I do, right next to my cell phone carrier. <laughs> That's the good thing about the Swiss. <laughs> army knife is you can just put it in your pocket you don't need a leather pouch for it but when push comes to shove which is a great cliche to write uh you can pull out that swiss army knife well you, i guess you're paying for all the tools rather than the comfort of the swiss army knife does that make sense kind of but why do the swiss have um, a corner on the market for tools <laughs> they got there like first <laughs> Like, they got their first and they got to name the yeah. multi-tool? If I'm an unknown country, I am just, if I'm a country that's jockeying for space on the worldwide, you know, market, I'll, I want to become known, I'm going to invent something that's very practical. And I'm just going to call it whatever the name of my country slash, you know, uh, leaf blower slash headlight. I don't know, something stupid. Like, just name that. and just I'm going to invent things and put my country's name in front of it. Yeah, French fries. Yeah. <laughs> Dutch ovens. Dutch, yeah, exactly. I could, I could go Swedish on and on Swedish meatballs. With the it's I just g- branding. I can yeah, gar- right, Swedish meatballs. I can guarantee you meatballs were around before Swedish meatballs, but these are Swedish meatballs. You don't, hear, you don't go, hey, give me some Italian meatballs. No. Yeah, <laughs> and then the word Swedish and the word meatball go together. Like, <laughs> Christian Slater or like Ryan Seacrest, Neil Patrick Harris. It just all goes right together. Those names really do go together. Ryan Seacrest. So Neil Patrick Harris. Wow. Guy Fieri. Not, not so much. Well, yeah. There's some people you got to say the first name and the last name all together. Neil Patrick it's like, Harris. A, it's like one oh, long got name. It. Like you have a friend named Chris Kelly. Like if, if I ever call him Chris or Kelly, no one knows what you're talking about. Chris Kelly. That's what it is. Oh, so Neil. Patrick. Oh yeah. I got it. Like Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, yeah. You know, Guy Fieri, too. No one ever just goes Guy. Everyone's a like Guy Fieri. Yeah, isn't that true with most celebrities, though? Like Mini Driver, Morgan Freeman. I guess you would always do the full name. Like what stars are there where you just say the last name or the first name? There's a lot of first names out there. I guess people do say Tom Cruise, but you don't really say Cruise. Hey, you see that Cruise is like Zendaya, Zendaya, well, that's... Rihanna. It's, it's women normally that have the one name. Yeah. Well, uh, the monikers. Leon was around. He was pretty great. Bautista. Hey, right. Wait, no, he's Dave Bautista now. He's Dave, yeah. Yeah. But, but it does seem the women are leading the way with the, the single name. Yeah. We need more. Slater? Not. Wait, what's a celebrity that you just say the last name of? You know, like McConaughey, actually. Mix, Pitt. Pitt. Probably Pitt. Yeah. Jolie. McConaughey. Yeah. Yeah. I think Jolie's a strong. You kind of know who you're talking Voight. Hoffman. Cruz. Pacino. No one says yeah. Al Pacino. And no one says Robert De Niro. It's just, hey, you see that De Niro picture? It's a good point. They, they, they're on a last name only basis, but it's got to be hard. It's pretty hard to get to that level where you're just last name. I feel like you could be first and last, but it takes a while just to be last. Yeah. It's like, hey, Wes Anderson. Tyson. Tyson. Wait, well, t- wait, Tyrese. You're right. But he goes by Gibson. As yeah. An actor, though. And Ludacris is Chris Bridges. Dang. Steven Spielberg. I guess people just say, I'm going to go see that Spielberg picture. Yeah. Because right. then you become that institution. That's interesting. You can't say Quaid because there's a bunch of them running around now. I feel like Morgan Freeman, though, could be at that level. But then you also have, like, Martin Freeman, and you got a few other Freemans out there. Yeah. And Freeman? No. Nah. Like, Nick Cage? No one just says, I'm going to go see a Cage picture. You just go, Nick Cage. I think that's we not got... even his real name, is it? Uh, Something else, yeah. But I think Scorsese, right? I'm going to go see that Scorsese picture. Yeah, you're right. That's the last name first. Whoa. We did it. Yeah, and we won't even go down with athletes because, you know, that's all over the place as well. Like Wait, Jordan. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's just – shoot. I'm going to go get the Jordans. Is there an athlete but, that oh, you always say the two names on it? Like Tom Brady? Yeah, Tom Brady. But LeBron is the first name. Oh, yeah. But Jordan's the last name. I think everyone says Favre. I guess Favre. No. Brett Favre. 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 Montana. Yeah. Man, Montana. You don't ever say what? What? What's Montana's Joe, for? Joe, Joe Montana. Joe, Joe Montana. <laughs> because I always just say Montana. I like where this conversation's gone. This is this is old school movie, films and flicks right here. 
20 minutes we're in. Through, we're, we're going through all the, like, the, the 90s football celebrity, <laughs> football <laughs> pro bowlers. I got to tell you, man, uh, like Mike Allstott, work done. I'm just naming Tampa Bay just Buccaneers now. Buccaneers. <laughs> Reggie White, and he was Packers. But it's <laughs> – you had a Reggie White jersey, didn't you? I did. Yeah, he was my favorite. He had that hook move that was probably the most epic I've ever seen from any defensive lineman. Did I ever tell you one time during football practice, there's a guy who did that stupid swim move? <laughs> like he was a senior, I was a freshman. He kept getting by me with the stupid swim move. Then they put in like the like a senior offensive like lineman to guard the guy doing the swim move, and the guy doing the swim move just got plastered. Yeah, because like, you're vulnerable, because you're kind of turned yeah. with your back to the person, and then it just leaves you open to just a gigantic push. It, it made me so happy. <laughs> just, Speaking of uh, swim move, we got this movie called Hard Race. <laughs> This is one of the most, you know, this was a movie that they just, I'm very happy we're talking about it. 1998. This is a, a time when, when disaster movies were everywhere. I mean, Deep Rising, Titanic, Di- Titanic, Dante's Peak, Volcano, Armageddon, Twister, Daylight, Firestorm. There were so many high, like, concepts. That's an impressive list that you just rattled off. Movies. Because, like, well, I've been really in a big kick lately of disaster pictures. Because, 1997, we're doing this Con Air podcast, but 1997 was loaded with terrible trips. Just people having horrible trips, breakdown, event horizon, just every nothing to lose, just adventures you do not want to go on to. So then I started thinking about disaster films, and then Hard Rain, and then Hard Rain has jet skis. So then that ties in all my other with Deep Rising. Yeah, yeah you've, in all your work with jet skis, you've never mentioned Hard Rain before. So yeah, I mean, because listen, Hard Rain. You don't think about the jet skis much because you're just focused on the water. Because it's so impractical. Like, this movie, Eric, they filmed it in gigantic stages. When you watch that, when I watch this movie, all I can think about is I'm glad I never worked on this. Like yeah. I am. Every actor that talks about it, Morgan Freeman, Mini Driver, Christian Slater, I said all their first names and last names. Uh, Randy Quaid, they all talk about it. Like we were freezing for six months. The 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 you know how slow this movie had to move. Like this is. And this movie cost what eighty million? Crawl, the movie that came out a couple years ago that looks amazing, cost thirteen. Makes me respect Carl Crawl more. But I still love it though. It's it's, it's love Crawl or Hard Rain. Hard Rain, despite all of its flaws, it's it's like you know somebody in a boardroom, Eric, was like, listen, these disaster pictures are hitting big. We need to capitalize. <laughs> Twister made a lot of money, and Twister's spinning, and there's wind and rain and cows, and we need something else. We need, you know, heat was popular, right? And that's a bank robbery. So we got to add something to heat meets Twister. Wait, we can't do a Twister. Uh, well, it's not coming. All right, so let's do a lot of rain. Remember Waterworld? But we'll do it in stages. We won't do it outside. So we'll put it in stages. You got 80 million. We'll get the BBC. We'll get companies all over the world. Christmas later, John Woo directs it. John Woo directs out. We get the guy who shot uh, The Abyss, which is amazing. The director of this shot The Abyss, so he knows all about horrible productions. Then we'll make it. We'll put some actors in it. Morgan Freeman. We'll make it a... a, a well, and this guy Kenny will get a lot of screen time because we can't have Slater wet all the time, so we'll just give other characters a lot of screen time. Bruce Springsteen quotes. No, we'll make an action picture. Like that's what was, this didn't come about. This yeah, was a, you nailed it. I nailed it. Like outside of the concept, it's really just paint by numbers, random themes and cliches throughout the movie. This did not come across organically. This movie. This no. movie came across very cynically. And when I mean cynically, you know, exploitation movies. You you make a movie that is currently hot. If there's a trend that's hot, like remember horror remakes in the 2000s? You know, like mm-hmm. If something's hot, you ride it. And I think, <laughs> like a jet ski. And so I think Hard Rain, they just kind of went, you know what? Let's just, uh, just uh, do a, let's do an arm truck robbery in a, in a rainstorm. You know how you can tell it's cynical though, is because it doesn't have, it's all over the place in terms of tone. They, <laughs> they had elements of gore. They had some thriller elements. They tried to add some comedy with Betty White. <laughs> <laughs> Doing our best, Lake Proto Lake Placid. Yeah, but but th- that's that's how I could tell that it, it was just so inorganic the way that it happened because it had no idea what it wanted to be. They just, like it ended on a joke. You just had a disaster movie and you're gonna end on a joke, mm-hmm. you know, about stained glass windows. Like I mean, I don't know, the whole thing it just had no idea what it wanted to be outside of the set. I mean, you know, you have it's quite gnarly too because you have guys getting shot in the eye you have people just getting electrocuted like a lot of you know randy quaid going evil and people getting murdered but then you have slater in a car like i think i had this car in high school like you know floating around let's just drive around the block a couple times uh and it's it 
but it, you know what though i i get, no matter what happens in this movie no matter where the plot goes no matter how the familiar the beats are no matter how high concept it is they still filled up gigantic sets put them on gimbals flooded them no one got electrocuted i, I, I I, you know, when I worked I, on I films, they that, had to have been in great shape afterwards because that was a lot of running <laughs> in like wasty water. I mean, I mean, that takes a lot of calories and a lot of energy to run <laughs> through water like up to your, your thighs. I would have taken this movie then, you know, so I get to run around for six months in water. Like, let me, I'll take it. Why not? It'd and, be in great shape. And people keep getting knocked out. Like, Minnie Driver gets knocked out during a scene because she probably just went, I'm tired of this. Just knock me out and I'll disappear for 30 minutes. Like uh, Morgan Freeman gets knocked out during a scene. He's like, I've had enough. Knock me out. Slater gets knocked out. And then he's put into a prison. Like This is a movie where I bet you actors are like, just knock me out. Just you give the lines to Kenny. And then they knock him out. Someone shoot me. <laughs> people just keep, yeah, people can keep just getting knocked out in this. And it's uh Freeman. They did reshoots to make Freeman more heroic because no one wanted him to be the bad guy. And but still, though, I mean, it features a jet ski chase inside of an elementary school, which is something I never thought I'd ever see in my life. So I give that credit. That's and original. It's it's, the, you know, the, the scene where where Minnie Driver has to help Slater out with her Swiss Army knife getting out of the prison cell. Like there's some good bits there. He gets the keys, but it's for a truck like that was that, that was amusing. I liked yeah. how he took the flashlight out to breathe through it. Yeah, I mean, that's a there's well some interesting part. That's a well-written scene that keeps the budget down. So, yeah, it's just I think when you get this much budget and if you looked at how many people funded this movie. So this was funded by uh, I mean, this had a huge one. I think it was um, like the BBC. Uh, oh, yeah. BBC Toho uh, UGC Paramount and then also the Mutual Film Company and then Telemunchen. Uh, so you had a worldwide group of people financing this. And then you have sorry if I mispronounced Munchen Munchen horribly so yeah i think there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen and then you just can't move with water eric you just can't do it man it's it had to have been such a slow production but it's still a good idea and it looks technically polished and no one got electrocuted so you got to give it props but like why would they do this after water world was a disaster with well, a massive water set well they because... went on stages they shot on stages so they no but they took over um an aircraft hangar where they built their planes but i mean just generally with that size of a set with all the water i mean there's got to be some kind of correlation between shooting in a ton of water and being miserable <laughs> i mean the crew mutinied on water world didn't they didn't yeah. they just yeah i mean so they went to hawaii to shoot uh and then you know they got price gouged a lot of people left tina margarino wore a prisoner costume during her thing because everyone was stuck there. Kevin Reynolds and Costner fought the whole time. I think they both got divorced during the shoot. <laughs> this is an absolute, like they shot in Hawaii. They couldn't really get off of where they were shooting. It was just a nightmare because they couldn't control the elements. So I bet you in hard rain, they're like, put it in an airport, put it in a hangar. Like let's shoot in a hangar. Yeah. We won't have the water oh, roll problems in there. So instead of making the same mistake again, they put it in a hangar to avoid the same yeah. steps as water world. That's I, an interesting take. I, I guarantee it because, you know, like, but it, that never works. Like after Coppola had gone way over budget on a bunch of movies, you know, apocalypse now and everything. They're like, when you make Bram Stoker's Dracula, you got to make it in stages. We're not putting you on location ever again. But then he took over every stage, got every shot in camera and they went gigantically over budget shooting on stages. So, I think you have good intentions to keep the budget down. This out on Hawaii or this in a in Ohio on a real place where they flooded would be a hundred and twenty million dollar movie in ninety eight. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, anytime you're moving with water, it's so slow, man. It's just so slow. And yes, so you said something interesting about high concept. And all right, I want to explore this a little bit because I didn't quite understand the whole high concept before I started researching this. To me, high concept kind of feels like a oxymoron. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it just means that it's not like the, the quality. It just means that it's it's heavy on the the concept of what's happening versus what's happening inside the lines. Yeah. Is that an accurate assessment? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like Memento and anything Christopher Nolan turns out, it's not high concept. You know, you're not explaining Inception to anybody. <laughs> you're not explaining Pulp Fiction to anybody. But if you say Hur if you say Hurricane Heist. Or if you snakes say, on a plane, snakes on a plane, oh, that's like the classic example. That's high concept because, you know, like a high level breakdown that you give to people. It's like a you could it's even quicker than an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is supposed to be a couple sentences, 30 seconds. But this one's just hurricane heist, 
Hard Rain. Titanic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, the, oh, Titanic. Like, that's it. We're making Titanic. Oh. Twister. But a tornado. Oh. Firestorm. About these guys who bust ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> a firestorm about a robbery during a firestorm. Dante's Peak. A vol- a volcano. Tommy Lee Jones saves LA from a volcano. Like, it's, <laughs> it's so easy to pitch. It's, I think it's great for so, buzzwords. Like it leads with the concept rather than the characters. Exactly. And like studio executives can market around that too. Like that's so easy to digest. And so, I mean, there, there was so many of these types of movies in the nineties, you know, it was just such, there's so many high concept films, action films that had budgets, dude, like deep rising cost 80 mil to make. It's beautiful, but it's, which cr- one was that? Was that the asteroid or the tsunami? So deep, no deep rising is the one on the cruise ship. Where Treat Williams, they battle a monster, and it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. It's hilarious. The guy who directed The Mummy did it, and it's like a wonderful movie. But yeah, there's What's Deep Impact though. Yeah, deep, deep yeah, impact. The, yeah, Deep Impact, and, the, and then Armageddon. So you had all these movies with natural disasters, and then they kind of just thought, well, let's uh, let's do a bank robbery during a you know a flood. Like that's that's it. Like if Twister had a bank robbery. So here's how I watched the movie. I don't think I saw it when it came out. I was just on HBO Max. I saw it pop up randomly, and I felt like it would be a nostalgia movie. But then I saw 98. It didn't feel like a movie that was in 98. It felt like a 92 or an 88. It felt like a like a cliffhanger with a henchman and a, like an everyman thrust into a dangerous situation. It did not feel like a 90, 98 movie. I know they had all the natural disasters, but I really thought it was earlier. Yeah, I think as far as like being as jocular and action prone as it was – because if you think about Volcano, Tommy Lee Jones isn't in action. He's just saving the world. Uh, if you think about Dante's Peak, it's Pierce Brosnan running from a volcano. Twister was Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt. So you had sort of blue-collar everyday people, but they weren't dealing with very muscular gunfights and double crosses and triple, triple, triple crosses. So I don't understand. Was the uncle in on it? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he's the one that set it up. Okay, but Slater wasn't supposed to pull his gun. Yeah, there are so many bad decisions in this. Like, if like if you can't see what's happening. Like you're completely blinded, and you're gonna pull a gun not knowing what's on the other side. Like, is is everything was so bad? All that is, I would be a way better everyman in a dangerous situation than Slater. Like, if Asner's in on it, he can be like, guys, turn off your lights. We're working together. Just come out here. Then they could have tied him up, taken the money, and gone. That seemed kind of thrown in, and then the whole Randy Quaid turning. Seemed a little tossed in. Well, so Christian Slater had all his talking points for his interviews, and he's like, it's not about the flood. It's about human nature instead of mother nature. (laughs) Oh, gosh. I mean, (laughs) that was the talking points in the interviews. Everyone was tempted by greed. I mean, I do like that story, though. Uh, I I do like the idea of certain death coming, flooding coming, and people want this money so bad. Like, one of my favorite movies the last few years is Triple Frontier. And one of the most startling things images i can think of is when they're literally weighed down by money when the helicopter has so much money on it they crash because they're way like their greed was so insane and then they're climbing through the mountains throwing bags slowly they're moving 50 feet every hour like they are weighed down by cash and so watching this greed between them watching what happens between these people how people turn on each other i i like that element of it it's just it's handled so very 92 action type you know, type way. That's, um, that's a really great reference because that's what happened here is where people who are not entirely bad, they kind of just get swept up into it and then they get too far into the situation that there's no turning back. Mm-hmm. I mean, the cops are like, listen, I know Randy Quaid's like their witnesses. We're going to kill them. But, but then they get to, you know, these are looters. We're going to shoot these looters. I can rationalize that in my head but then they bring the hunter along who's a maniac and then you know it all devolves but this isn't this isn't like the treasure of sierra madre you know this is the hard rain so you have the concepts but i don't think they're ever fully explored and you make freeman kind of a saint type character which... yeah and how many people died and he's all like i mean I'm for the money i got a bag of money and i'm happy After yeah all these people died well those those are reshoots he's like I sh-. he's like they tried to not make me the villain he was mad about that but you know, it's – you know Christian Slater? Did you you know about his law problems during this time? Yeah, and that's what – another similarity with Waterworld, the toxic publicity 
I saw some interviews that he did to promote the movie, and he had to take his lumps. Like, he yeah. really had to – I mean, he had to go out there um, – I'm not condoning what he did when he was high and or whatever – um, but he, he had to go do that circuit, <laughs> be a good soldier with that much money invested in the movie. So he, he got out there and, and did his interviews and answered the tough questions. Yeah. And he, so I guess he, so he, I think he's been sober since cause he made his comeback with Mr. Robot, but he, he's also in mind hunters, but he was, um, this is kind of gnarly. He was, he was high on heroin and alcohol and something else. He hadn't slept in days and then he was attacking his girlfriend. Then he beat up a guy who was trying to protect hit Slater's girlfriend and then the cops came he tried to grab a cop's gun and so during these interviews just hearing him talk about it he's like yeah uh and Robert Downey Jr. was in jail at the same time so they, well and it was like and that was it the Downey Jr. one which got everyone's attention about actors going to jail mm-hmm. and then this happened and it was and it, they were all over it but this was his third arrest too like he had yeah. DUIs and other things happening too man the publicity machine with Hugh Grant Christian Slater <laughs> <laughs> uh robert downey jr in the 90s man i don't there should be a tv show about that just the, the excess of well, well, well has yeah you're you're right but you know what's interesting i think because we have so much more content these days and because like the amount of movie stars arguably proportionally is less than it was in the 90s mm-hmm. we don't hear about this stuff happening anymore but i think it's because there's so many people on tv reality and movie the, stars tv streaming twitch tiktok the in the the news chat the yeah. news moves so fast dude like people are com- talking about she hulk tonight but by friday people would be talking about lord of the rings and then by sunday people would be on house of the dragon so it's <laughs> we didn't really yeah, have yeah. that in the 90s i don't even think you know sopranos wasn't around yet so we weren't at peak tv i think oz maybe was kicking around so i mean we had seinfeld and everything but it wasn't you know, it wasn't big yet. So yeah, I think yeah, the storylines lingered. lingered. They, you're right. They lingered longer. Like today, it'll be an intense 24 hours. Yeah. And then you just got to weather the storm and it's over. Yeah. So, but like, yeah, this here in the, qu- he was, he was quite honest about it too, the questions, but he's like, I got a problem. <laughs> I'm not you know, laughing, it, but yeah, it's, it's, it's what he said. Yeah. Like he just, he just took it head on. Mini driver said something about him too. She's like, um, I think she said something like, there's some people who get in trouble and you go like, what? She's like, there's some people she said who, if they get in trouble, you go, what an idiot. She's like, I don't really care what happens to them, but Christian is not that guy. He's directed and now he's producing. So he has so much to offer. Uh, he's like, I think he will once he gets all this behind him. So she kind of said like, he's, he just had demons. <laughs> he had to exercise. I'm yeah. not condoning anything. Well, his behavior was abhorrent. So don't, I laugh when things I, are really I bad. You. I don't, I don't, uh, that's like my reaction. I know we're getting in the weeds with this, but yeah, this got hit with that. It's also, well, it's also movie... almost 30 years ago, too. Yeah. So, I mean, it's way. But, like, yeah, the fact that she stood up for a co star, and, I mean, that's a dangerous line to walk there. You know what I like about Minnie Driver, and I never knew this? Reading the interviews for her, she got in so much trouble because she just ran her mouth during interviews, and she got, like, into a feud with Judy Dench. And she, she, she just, she was unfiltered during her interviews. And I guess her sister was like, You're not doing any more interviews alone ever again. <laughs> she, yeah, you know. I, I can't do an accent to save my life, but I could not um I could not just grasp Mini Driver as an American. <laughs> you can totally tell she was struggling with accent, but I, I say that because I'm unable to do accents. But uh yeah, I I did not buy Mini Driver. Like in Goodwill Hunting, she played a, a British woman. And, really? You know, it was great. Yeah. Well, yeah, she had the accent in Goodwill Hunting, didn't she? Oh. I I just know Ghost Gross Point Blank. She pulled it off. I you know, she I didn't... did. I didn't know she was British until I read really? interviews. Yeah, I, I had no clue. I, I always was like, "Why is she in Goldeneye?" And um, and eventually I learned that she was British. And I went, "Oh, <laughs> that same thing happened to me to uh, Juno Temple from when I was watching Ted Lasso, and I heard her speaking with the the her accent, her real accent. I went, "Wait, that's a good accent. Like she's she's legit." And then I learned that she's you know from English. I was like, "Wait, what?" Is it me or are we seeing a really um, significant increase in UK actors in every single show <laughs> on TV? It's really impressive what they've done with their academies to have this many actors at such a high level. They seem to be very classically trained, I think, out there. I think, I don't yeah. know, maybe the training's just different, but yeah, they're I, popping up all over the place. They must have a better, 
you know, for lack of a better term, grassroots or um, pathways to to acting. Illuminati. I, I, I do I do like hearing some of the bad American accents though. I I love Benedict Cumberbatch, but in this movie called The Mauritanian, he his accent just it, it almost it almost floored me. Like it almost just made me turn into sludge. You know, I I yeah. Uh, and then. What Rafe Spall? I like him, but he has one of the oh, meatiest... Oscar Isaac Moon Knight. He pulled off the British accent. He's oh, able yeah. to do it. He's one of the few that that's able to to make it happen. Yeah, we need first yeah, work. Keanu didn't do it too well for us for Bram Stoker's Dracula, so we need more people going over there and, and dropping the accents. We got Renee Zellweger and we've got Oscar Isaac, and that's it. <laughs> who can who can do it? <laughs> Keep going, but yeah, I mean, this movie though, I mean. It, it had talent behind the scenes. It had a, it had a big uh, budget. I mean, this was 70 million. Someone gave this movie 70 mil. But, you know, John Woo was supposed to direct it. And John Woo was super hot at the time because he he went on to do um, Baroque uh, Face Off instead. But that would make you, a you, lot more sense. At least it would have been consistent. Yeah. It would have just been a shoot 'em up movie. With a lot of style, melodrama. Because, you know, Woo loves his melodrama. And I think he could have handled it really well. Cool. There was a lot of slow motion in this one. Did you notice that? Like Morgan Freeman coming out of the water and shooting. Oh, or Christian wow. Slater like jumping off the balcony. Oh, gosh. <laughs> slow motion. Like it seems so out of place. I like, wonder. Morgan Freeman out of the water. I wonder if what they did was they really just went off a lot of his storyboards. Because, you know, Slater was in Broken Arrow, which was a John Woo film. So I, I kind of wonder if a lot of the work that he laid down moved into this. Because – this could have been so simple. You might be right. This could have been a very um, meat and potatoes film, but I think it has one twist too many. Like, if that makes sense. Like, I think. Speed, well, I knew it because it was an hour in, and there's the big gunfight, and I'm like, there's 30 minutes left. Like, a, this can't be the end. What's going to happen? Yeah, and then Quaid, tur- and then you know Quaid's going to turn. Well, they introduced the beginning where he was kind of looking down the street. He made some cr- like weird remarks. By the way, the quotes in this thing were awful. I like low, dialogue, life, low life scumbags. There was a butt wipe reference. Yeah. You know, you're in the 90s when there's a butt wipe. <laughs> like the, the, the guy on the jet ski was like, that's what you get for stealing my jacket, butt wipe. <laughs> oh, yeah, I read that. Oh, yeah. Nice, <laughs> nice driving butt wipe. Oh, uh, the worst the worst quote was a Quaid when he's for 20 years. I've been eating shit. For breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Tonight, I'm changing the menu. Everything I eat will be shit-free. That's an actual quote from the movie. Man, and you know what's nuts? Graham Yost wrote this movie. I don't know if you know about Graham Yost. But no, I he, don't. He wrote Speed. Uh, he wrote Broken Arrow. He went on to write Band of Brothers, From the Earth to the Moon. Like He, he wrote episodes of the Pacific. He r- developed Justified and wrote a lot of the episodes. Uh, this is a very established writer at the time. But he said that there were no Joss Whedon punch-ups on it. And he said Hard Rain's the one movie where he didn't have Joss Whedon punch-ups, and you can probably tell. So I thought that was kind of funny of him to say. He's like, I probably should have had Joss Whedon punch-up this script. But it it felt like a PG-13 movie that got switched over to an R rating. It's very easily been a PG-13 movie. So I wonder, you know, I don't know why it was an R. Wait, I'm making sure it's an R. They didn't didn't need some of the, the parts in it that they had. Wait, it's R, right? I'm, uh, this is a really stupid question to ask, but I feel 100% certain that it yeah, is. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, so it's an R, R-rated movie, and it has the word butt wipe in it. But still, we're slagging on this movie a lot, Eric. This I know. I, I try to look at the positive more and more, but uh, yeah, it's. It, I'm, we'll, we'll look for the good in the second half yeah. of the episode. I just think, still though, it's a, it's a, these people put a lot of expense into giving audiences a different look. And that I think has to be admired to a certain extent because they just, they, it slowed down the movie. I think the movie became more about the effects than, than about the performances and plot, but at least they thought to themselves cynically, let's, let's flood a hangar and like, let's put stuff in there because we've never seen a movie since like hard rain. And for good reason, you're absolutely right. We haven't seen this. Like how um, many countless action films have we forgotten about because they're all the same? This is hard rain. <laughs> this is something we haven't seen. I think it's worth a watch today just to get an idea for those practical effects that would probably just be CGI right now. 
Yeah, I mean, that's probably why. So they just went straight CGI. But yeah, I do. You know, it's a good point to look at the positive. They did take a risk. They took a big risk, and it was pretty ambitious when you when you look at it. I mean, yeah, I mean, super. And also too, when they're filming in those tanks, that's pretty good war- atmosphere work because you're in a hangar shooting. And you don't feel the really like Sleepy Hollow is beautiful, too. That's great studio work. And I think that's 99 when that came out. But you you don't ever think to, I, I watch on these cheap. I watch a lot of shark movies, Eric. And you can tell when they shoot in a tank because the water's crystal clear and the water doesn't move. But in Hard Rain, man, like, they <laughs> did really good tank work on this. I love yeah. the tank well, work in this. It was movie. all at night, too. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, it's nice, too. It's at night, but you just shoot it inside when it's dark and you're shooting during the day so it's probably a little bit easier on the crew you know it's kind of nice about this movie I, I feel like once you get everything flooded and then you get some actors in it kind of just runs for itself the rest of the day the camera crew is kind of screwed the grips and electrics but if I, like there's no extras if i was first team on this movie you're just getting the actors yeah. dry so it's you know that wouldn't be terrible to work on but it's just still though i still appreciate this movie because even though we're hating on it not hating on it. We're expressing our thoughts about it. It, it try. Like, so I, I don't give any movie props for trying. I, there's nothing yeah. more I hate about a movie when it's just stock. There's some movies you watch that just feel. Well, let's stock. talk about things that we liked. Like I liked the chemistry between Minnie Driver and Christian Slater. I mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. I like that they made Morgan Freeman a bad guy. I mean, that's like, that's, that's a risk. That's like making Denzel a, a Denzel first name. Yeah, hey, there we go. Oh, yeah. Go. Yeah, first, but you can make Denzel a bad guy, like a training day. That's risk mm-hmm. to do that, to make someone so beloved. And even though they redeemed him, yeah, I mean, they want, and then they had to reshoot it because test audiences didn't like it. So they tried different things. So, you know, I think Minnie Driver reminds me of Imogen Poots. No matter who Imogen Poots is on screen with, she has great chemistry with them. And I feel like Minnie Driver does that too because Gross Point Blank, Goodwill Hunting, Hard Rain. I think yeah. There's, well, there's, I think she's just awesome. She's yeah. just an awesome. <laughs> she seems like, blunt. When you're awesome, you you naturally get along with everybody. Yeah, she seems super blunt, and I kind of like that about her. Just talk talking what you, you know, talking what you said, talking what you mean. But yeah, I mean, I I like the chemistry, and also, dude, there's fun jet ski. You know me, I love jet ski action scenes. We're on jet skis, going woo. How, uh, how would you rate that jet ski scene in the pantheon of other jet ski scenes? Well. I would have okay. So I've done. I've talked about this before, where like Transporter Two, Jason Statham is like, I'm looking super cool on a jet ski. F. Like, um, Transporter refueled. He goes in a straight line. F. Get out of here. Uh, this movie though, they are getting like they're turning, getting stuck, and they have to do three point turns to get around the school. The, and he the, wrecks on it. The guy wrecks on the jet ski, too. Yeah, they wipe out. And the, the the nice thing about the jet skis in this movie is they're practical. Like, we don't want to have something that could hit the bottom. So we need something that can go through the water without going too deep. So you get a jet ski. Like, it's it's a very It was pra- less about the indulgent nature of choosing the jet ski. Yeah, it's not like, I'm on a boat. It's, I'm on a, uh, we, this is the most practical idea we can use. We can get in and out of alleys. They are unwieldy, and it shows that it's unwieldy. And I mean, listen too though, when they're going full speed and they're cutting corners in that middle school, that's pretty cool looking. That's cool. They built that set. They flooded that set to have a jet ski action scene. So you automatically give this movie a B minus. Like if someone said, Mark, what is hard rain? If I know there's a jet ski action scene in it, a good one, I'm like B minus immediately. But what's the moral here though? Like you could do everything right. Like 90% of this was the set. But if you get 10% with the dialogue and the tone wrong, it's a bust. Is that the moral? Well, I think they were so concerned with the hard rain. We got to flood this set. We have to build this. Everything became about the rain in that movie, flooding the sets, wetting the set, the the sprinklers. Like, I I don't think the best plots for me, like look at Collateral, right? It's it's Tom Cruise and Jamie Foxx in a taxi cab going to five places. Eventually they go to six, but it's very simple, very simple plot. But that reams leaves a lot of room for character development. The performances on on both were among amazing, the best of a generation. I yeah. mean, even look at Cliffhanger. It's they dumped the money, and now they need Stallone and Rourke to help. Uh, no, M- what's the guy's name? Uh, Rooker. The guy from Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy. They're, yeah. they're like, hey, help us find the money. Like you're gonna help us find the money, and then you can have character beats throughout that. So this hard rain, you know, 
there was no there was no character development for Slater. There was no there's nothing simple about it either because you're going to yeah. you're going to a prison, then you're going to a graveyard, then you're going to this, and then you're going through a school, and so it, there's no and there's also no linear structure to it because you don't know when they're going to be going, when, where, why, and how, and like there's no we're here, we're going to go here. So collateral's like I I'm going here. We got five stops. Mad Max Fury Road. We're driving this way. We're driving back, and that leaves room for character development. At least for that's what I think. And when you don't have that when this this movie's quite aimless in where it goes so then it just it just doesn't everything's about the rain there's no clear abc goal the characters are just fall you don't care about any of them uh, maybe mini driver yeah. and slater but so then you think it was um like blinders on like yeah. blinders or like uh maybe they were you know lost sight of of the audience and were thinking about this creation that they were making yeah dude i, I think they just thought this is huge and this rain takes up everything but there's no look what urgent. we created no. look everyone's gonna appreciate this world that we created and then they didn't and, and it's kind of stupid too that they're not like hey we got 20 minutes until this the dam breaks and we're dead there's no countdown clock in it there's just ah oh, whatever we'll be all right if you well, there at, was a dam, like the one guy working at the dam. Yeah, and then, <laughs> but, but then he leaves. <laughs> one single person yeah. working at the old dam protecting the city. I got to open all these doors. But yeah, he opens all the doors, it breaks, but like there's no concussive flood. It's just, I don't know. I think you need a, a really simple structure in here, which is an arm truck robbery, and they're trying to stop the people from robbing them. Like you'll, you don't even need the cops, really. You just... You know, the cops go get killed halfway through or, you know, you know what I mean? Or halfway through you introduce them or I don't know, but you just don't okay. need that. Like you got to so have a simple should it structure. Should be more like ambulance when it was about the chase Dude. or should it be more like the town where it was the botched robbery um, and then you really felt for the characters when they went down one by one? So like the town's more about the characters, right? You think about. I do. Yeah, that one's a gut punch yeah. at the end. Like Aflac going up to. Ooh, to Renner, hey, I can't tell you what we're doing, but come with me. And Renner's like, I, I got you, <laughs> I got you. Let's go. That's uh, a good and, line. And you, you have Rebecca Hall, you have John Hamm. I think that's more about the characters. But Ambulance is one of the most repulsive movies I've, I've ever seen. So I hated, I hated that. I'm uh, sorry, I don't mean to be negative, but like, how do I root? For, I can't root for these people. I don't, I don't feel bad. I mean, they shot it in 35 days for 35 million. And it's just, I, th I feel like it's just a marvel of filmmaking in this day and age. And I love how it gets in and out. But see, I, I also had to watch every single Michael Bay movie. <laughs> oh, that's right. You counted the explosions. All of the explosions. So nothing, his movies feature a lot of bad, terrible people, man. Like they're not, even the good people aren't likable. And so I don't, this is the first movie ever of, of his films where he tries to take bad guys and make them relatable. With the insurance type stuff, that's the first time he's ever done that. But I'm, I guess I'm more talking about with ambulance, how propulsive it is. You get on this, we, we rob this place, we're on a thing, and they say it's a V8, it's a beast. This thing could drive all day, and then you have a great driver, and then they're chased. Like it's just economical filmmaking by a director who no other director could make that movie for in 35 days for 35 million. I guess is the aspect I love about it. Yeah, they had to close off a lot of streets. Yeah, a lot and, of permitting. Oh God, must have been and the good thing it was during a, the the pandemic, so they were able to kind of make oh, it yeah. make it happen. And inside, you know, you you could be driving around somewhere, and you don't have to like cut down on that budget. But it's I think I think Card Rain would work better like that. Just you, but there's no goal. There's no goal at all. They get the money halfway through, so I think they're like just going into it. You never know. It's I don't know. Does that, does that make sense? I I think yeah. Like the raid, like dude. Top bottom of the building, top of the building, <laughs> die hard. He's stuck in a building. Like you just know where yeah, it's going. It was going. driven by bad decisions, like these people making the wrong decisions. Yeah, and it never comes together. I guess for me, at least. But it still, dude. Like, at least they, but see, yeah. but see, I know how they lose track of that. When you, like, have you ever taken on a wildly ambitious thing, but then you forget about the bare necessities because you you're so in the muck with. With doing something, you forget to add the little ingredients because you're worried about not flooding an entire hangar and electrocuting people. So uh, I think that's where the movie went, at least for me. That's what I think. No, oh, those are great points. Hey, let's take a break, and I, I got some pretty – I got a torrent of questions for you. All right, cool. Hey, <laughs> so we'll take a break, and then when we come back, we will talk more. Hard rain. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Movies, Films, and Flicks. 
talking more hard rain, Eric. Yeah, but I got news for you. The dam goes, it'll wipe out the entire town. Screw the town. <laughs> Actual quote for the movie. <laughs> and you know what I love, too, about this movie is all the characters' names are so chill. You have Jim, Tom, Karen, Ray, Phil, Hank. <laughs> like they're very... <laughs> It's very. They're, they're no Chris Brander or Jamie Palomino. <laughs> yeah, you have Kenny. Like, there's no Lucius. Like, it's all. That's a great point. I didn't even remember their actual names. Tom, Karen, Jim, Ray, Phil, Hank, Kenny. I remember Kenny because I remember thinking Kenny's got a lot of screen time. <laughs> Kenny, well, it, it's like if someone from LA was like, "What are some small town names?" <laughs> That's what it feels like. Yeah, pretty much. Cletus. This is Ohio, man. This isn't like. What do you do? You know what the... <laughs> What? So there's hot. no Clems. There's no Clems or Jethro's here. Yeah, bro, this is Pittsburgh. Like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> oh man. I, uh, so yeah, uh, you had some questions for me, huh? Yeah, questions for Mark. Can, can we revisit the whole tropes thing? Um, so I have a hard time sometimes differentiating between themes, tropes, and cliches. So I've got some aspects of this movie. I'm gonna run it by you, and you let me know if it's like a theme, trope, cliche, or something else. Okay. Do we want to break down the definition of each real quick? So yeah, knows? yeah. Why don't Why don't you go for it? So, so like, I, I guess for me, the best thing I can think about is a trope is when you you superheroes wear capes or there's a cabin in the woods for a horror film. There's certain tropes in certain films that aren't necessarily negative, like a cabin in the woods. You have the slasher trope, the final girl trope. They aren't exact. Like I don't think those are negatives. I think they stick to the playbook, but I think if you don't have a lot of budget and you want to make a simple film, it's okay to stick to the horror tropes. Like, if you can handle the tropes really well and even subvert some of them, then you are an effective filmmaker. So tropes are just sort of the cabin in the woods, the slasher, the 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 uh, the final line at the end before you kill the bad guy. Like, the, all those tropes. Like, the tropes. But, so can a trope be a cliche or can a trope just be overused? So like I think tropes are more the like cabin in the woods, whereas a cliche is you're dead as a doornail. Like cliches, like you know, and you know about or the this. final like, word, the final like, word before yeah, you pull the trigger like, or something. You know when you, I mean, you know about this. It's more of like a phrase or opinion that's overused, like the cliche, like you're you're dead as a doornail, or you're just phrases that are so cliche that you know you're taking someone a take it you're taking a commonly known phrase and using it because you don't want to come up with new words for it if that makes okay. sense yeah that's what a cliche is like i think you know in writing you know you have your, you have a master's in writing so it's journalism uh and so just you know when you're writing too like oh they got the break speed off of them you're like no they lost 37 to 14 it was, you know it, I, I think sometimes yeah. you rely on cliche when writing the, the the town's gonna break. Who cares about the town? Like that's very cliche. Easy, it's yeah. Easy writing. Like, yeah. So it's like kind of kind of cliche that. And then the theme is like the overall theme of it. It's like what like the overall theme of the black coat's daughter is loneliness. Like there's mm. what's the theme of what it's we're. It's a like? higher level. Yeah. Okay. So how about this? An every man stuck in a dangerous twist. It's like a trope. What is that? That's a trope. Yeah, because you know, taken. Trope. Well, he's not an everyday man, but you know what I mean. Die hard. Like it's, it's far from an everyday man. <laughs> yeah, like, but like a uh, breakdown. That would everyday man wife is kidnapped. That's a trope of the film. If that yeah. makes sense. Or like almost every horror movie where you have the one person that rises up. Yeah, the final girl, final guy, all that kind of stuff. Like that's the trope. All right. How about the heist that is tragically escalated? Like it didn't mean to go. It goes sideways. People die unnecessarily. I think that's more of a trope, but if during during it, if you have the the one person who's always you know is the hot shot that's like you know doing coke, like that's really cliche, like the hot shot guy doing coke who's gonna get you all in trouble, if that makes sense. But that's a trope yeah. of action films, and then you could add cliches to the dialogue or what happens, if that makes sense. Okay, all right, got it. Now getting swept up into a bad situation to the point where there's no backing out. I think like that's... it could be uh what is it like bad bosses was it <laughs> oh yeah, yeah or like where you just get or the hangover where you're swept up into the situation and and then you're so far in that your only recourse is to keep going i think it's just the hmm it's not a theme it's got to be tropes again because if you think about in hangover they get blasted and very bad things they get blasted 
wasted. You know, like it's that trope of people getting, dude, where's my car? The trope of people getting pl- plowed and then brought into worse situations. That dude, that sense. was a perfect example. Very bad things. Yeah. Uh, ambulance hey, had that. The driver. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that idiot. Yeah, like that's like such a stock. You know, doing uh, doing a crime for the insurance money. Oh, I thought you were talking about the uh, sandals guy <laughs> who gets his legs run over. I thought you were talking about him. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, don't yeah, you always know. Socks. Yeah, you already know who's gonna get whacked. Yeah. You just do it. All right, so uh, conflict amongst the um, antagonists, or for lack of better words, conflict amongst the the quote bad guys. Yeah. Um, is that it seems like an interesting writing ploy because it's you can go a lot of directions with that. The people, the bad guy with the conscience, the rock, you have like the ultra bad guy. Yeah, the rock has that. Um, Con Air like, has that. Remember the rock when Ed Harris doesn't want to light the nukes and the guy's are like, we're here, we're doing it. So you have that's a way right. of that's a way of making you know, you, you want to have a sympathetic villain, but by having a sympathetic villain, you have <laughs> Really, really bad guys. You can't have the sympathetic villain without being balanced by the really bad villain. Yeah, exactly. And so you have that's that's the sympathetic villain with the the, the one henchman who's a straight up murderer. So I think that's sort of the trope of those characters. So is that a trope? Conflict amongst antagonists? Yeah, because that's not a cliche. Like if they said stupid things, then that would be cl- cliche. Like no, you're not. Or uh, like a common phrase would be very cliche. Does that make sense yeah. to you? Yeah. Like I hear you. in writing the cliche is just that, but I mean, I, I, I just think tropes are just like a common convention that's used. Like it's a writing device. Yeah. And then cliches so, are the dialogue within that. Like I always knew yeah. it was you Fredo, you know, like, I don't know. So what about henchmen getting eliminated one by one just so they can go from action scene to action scene? I mean, that's just a storytelling beat, right? But then that also becomes – because every action film that happens, there's always – so you have the trope of – but I mean, if you think about it, there's always the pattern. The Raid, which I think is one of the greatest action films ever made, that he has to fight Mad Dog before he gets to the guy. Every John Wick film, there's always the, the legit henchman that he has to beat up at one of the Raid guys in John Wick 3. You always have to beat up – uh, commando you have to beat bennett before you get to the guy like there's always the the um what well, i i listened to your under siege episode recently and was tommy lee jones that was that was the minor boss before he got to the main boss or was he the main boss yeah, oh yeah but see in in seagal films no one ever fights him he just kills everybody immediately like so even the final boss is essentially like arnold schwarzenegger stallone jcvd they all sold more than Seagal did. Seagal never sold for people. So, yeah. He, he was like, here I am. Worship me. Yeah. And well, and actually, in Under Siege 2, he had to kill the guy before he got to the computer guy. But in, in Under Siege, he had to fight Tommy Lee Jones, knife fight him, and then he just stabs Tommy Lee Jones in the top of the head. But yeah, I mean, you have the trope of the the second in command, who's a, a, a kind of a, a, a legit tough guy. You have the Kenny guy. Who's the idiot that's always going to mess stuff up? Those are just the the kind of common conventions that are in most of these movies. Dude, great answers. Uh, two more questions for you. So I one thing I did like about this is I, I kind of like the idea of amateurs trying to pull off a heist. Like yeah. it, it's it's kind of interesting. Like um, I don't when they're pros like in Ocean's Eleven, it's it's fun, it's stylish, it's interesting with the characters. But I don't know what do you, what are your thoughts between like uh, George Clooney and Brad Pitt pulling up a heist, you know, and then small town cops who uh, have a lot to lose and are kind of like half in, half out. Oh, man. So I actually I absolutely love capable people being capable in movies so like Tenet. That guy's just super capable and he's being capable in the movie. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I think Ocean's Eleven is more of a hangout picture. I don't think they have major stakes. That's more just to be about style. But if you think about some of my favorite movies are. Uh, Blue Ruin, where a guy is on a quest for revenge, but he's terrible at it, and it just makes the most m- malicious violence you could ever think of. Green Room. No one's good at it in there, and it, right. just, it becomes... It's just, it's just messy. Yeah, and I think that's when it's at its best, but when you have... Sometimes when you have people who aren't great at it, but then they kind of fall into it, and they're, like, pretty good, that, you know, I don't... <sighs> what was the movie with Adam Driver and Channing Tatum in West oh, Virginia? Oh, but they were so good at what they did, though. Logan Lucky? 
Yeah, that was fun yeah. because they were they were kind of amateur like, but it it was more fun. I don't know. To me, it was more interesting and relatable. Yeah, you know that's a great point because they had to get Daniel Craig out of there, but they had to use the bare necessities to get things out. Like you know, Riley Keough, she's awesome at driving, but she's also a hairdresser. Like they're just sort of you know they have issues going on, but then they're super smart. Like that, I love. We're talking about that, Megan and I soon because we love Logan Lucky. It's. So if I had to pick between, gosh, but that's tough. I think that's one of the great parts about horror movies, though, where it's these, it's a kid overcoming something bigger than itself, and they're amateurs by winning. If that makes sense. Yeah, it kind of gives hope for people. Yeah, that I could, if they could do it, I could do it. But if I had to take one, I'd take capable (laughs) characters. Okay. I I don't know why. I you could you could do a lot more. Yeah, with them. I just like Die Hard. Bruce Willis is very capable. Uh, Predator. Those guys are very capable. And so, but then you put them in a situation that's above them. So all their actions are quite capable, but they're still outgunned. I always, and speed. Like, look, like, I love that Sandra Bullock was just really good at driving the bus. Like, I would like that there was no, whoa, she's, like, just, she's capable. She just step right up to handle it. Yeah. Like, I like that sometimes because I feel like it, it takes a lot of the unnecessary story beats out and you can focus on the core plot. But I also like the movies where there's no bullets in the gun. You know, like, there's no bullets in it. Like, you're, what are you doing? Uh, there's a movie I love called Revenge. It's very bloody. I don't, I, it's, I don't know if a lot of people love it because it's like a French film that just goes wildly extreme. But the, the lady in it who's on her quest for revenge, she's not good at it. And it just leads to some of the gnarliest scenes you'll ever see. But I guess I only like the movies where it's a person who's not skilled when it, it doesn't treat the violence as fun. It treats the violence as ugly because that's what most violence is. Like, I think there's a difference, I guess. But, yeah. I'll, hmm. but the, no, it's a good question. We can explore it another time. Yeah. All right. There we go. My next question is uh, e- Roger Ebert. I always go back to Roger Ebert. He, he had a, a note in his review that said, Morgan Freeman is good at looking wise and insightful. But the wiser and more insightful he looks, the more I wanted him to just check into a motel and order himself some hot chocolate. It, so I, can, can, can you be a good bad guy? If you are wise and insightful. And then the other second half of the question is, it seemed like the whole movie, he tried to avoid violence. He really tried to avoid violence, but then everybody died. So I'm like, can you have a bad guy that wants to avoid violence uh, and, and make a good movie? Oh, let's see. So he, by his avoiding violence, people die. I mean, what are some movies where the villain wanted to avoid violence? If the, I can't think of any. But yeah, if the, if if Freeman was so smart, well, there's a lot of like, don't kill him now because we need him later, or we need don't yeah. do it because we need something. There's not like, no, I just I had this moral quandary where I'm in it for the money. I don't want to hurt anybody. Yeah, Aaron Newworth, I I, t- I said I was going to be covering this movie. He's like, take take a shot every time someone says, like, it's I, I just want the money. <laughs> uh, or every time someone crawls into a boat, like, are, are drinking games still a thing? Yeah, no probably i think that uh, i think that went away kids. in the 90s yes yeah, exactly. <laughs> we got hard older rain too. hard rain killed the drinking game every time it rains oh no well you know those villains who try to goad people into violence by just annoying them and playing mind games they try yeah. to make is that i guess when it comes to in this one of freeman he should have taken off as soon as this thing went pear-shaped as soon as someone died just get out of there yeah, and someone with a gun has it and it's flooding just get out. Just go. Like just. There's more armored trucks. <laughs> There'll be more uh, things going on. So that's another problem with. Yeah, I guess they don't have to, but he keeps pursuing the money because he wants it. But you never get that desperation from him. We never get to spend time with him in the beginning, knowing how much he wants this money. If that makes sense. I mean, we don't need that, but he keeps going for it. And then he. T- yeah. yeah. And then the first time they introduced him was the bar, and he threatened to kill Kenny. <laughs> For talking about the money. Oh, gosh. And then but Kenny the goes and puzzle. shoots a guy, and you're like, ugh. Yeah, it's – man. They, but see, the re, they had to reshoot it. So maybe his, his – I think his character got his comeuppance in it. But then they made him alive and turned him a hero. You're right. With all the reshoots, it, it just kind of threw everything off probably. Now, some reshoots are fine. You go shoot a big-budget movie, and you're like, okay, we need to do things here and there. But they had to wholesale change it. So any changes that you have are not going to feel organic. You know, Con Air – that fire truck chase at the end was was added. And whenever you watch it, you're like, man, I don't even remember this scene. So, yeah, I, I think the reshoots hurt it. 
I think the it, they should have if they were going to do that they should have teamed him up with Slater sooner and then introduced the um Randy Quaid guy as a villain earlier if that makes sense yeah like, that was like maybe two thirds of the way through the movie because yeah, they were still arguing remember they go into the place he's like oh that hurt and he's like good and then he's like what is he saying I'm gonna get hepatitis he's like you gotta worry about that um <laughs> And I do like okay. Chekhov's statue too. They run the boat into it, and that's that knocks Norman uh, Morgan Freeman out, and he's out for a while. So they got him out of play. So yeah, right. They also yeah. put the boat through the stained glass windows. Oh god, that she <laughs> that, that her pumps work so hard to do. Yeah, are there any other movies? I mean, maybe this one goes back to the originality. What other movies do you think of where there's a busted dam or a levee with impending doom? I can't think of another movie where this is uh, in play, and and I think. And like someone's listening out there. Oh, that was, but yeah, that was a massive dam. You're right. But like, I don't know if someone's watching, like this could be, you know, something that could resurface. San Andreas had it. Oh wait, here we go. Dam burst. Oh, Superman. (laughs) IMDb has everything, Eric. Dante's Peak. Evan Almighty. Um, the 78. Let's see. Yeah. I mean, there's not many. There's not too many giant dams busting. You know, a lot of monster movies they knock dams over, but they look. But they're tiny. all they're all giant dams. Yeah. They're not like a like a city dam. I, don't, I can't think of too many more than than this one. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh, dang. Yeah, this is my question. Do you know the original title of the movie was The Flood? So I think that backs up your point about someone was like, we need another disaster movie that hasn't been done yet. Well, think about the flood. That this is a very John Woo move because he liked to explore. You know, John Woo loves to explore sort of melodrama and character beats. You know, you know, you know what's great about Face Off is the the prison escape with Nick Cage. The it, there's a lot of sort of moral questions there because he's trying to escape, but innocent cops are being killed. And then when the scene when the gangsters are being slaughtered by the cops, you feel bad for the gangsters because they're being slaughtered by the cops. So he likes to add some really interesting dynamic action scenes that make you feel different things like as these villains are being killed slaughtered by the cops on travolta's orders you feel for them so it makes you feel different things and think about like moral questions but then you have you know the flood remember the flood wipes people out and it and then it raises the questions about greed and then that takes them out so i think the flood makes more sense if you were going to go more like triple frontier more sort of yeah yeah but then hard rain (laughs) hard rain firestorm hard rain chill factor uh, most dangerous game yeah, Ooh, i love that movie i love that that's like one of my favorite short stories ninth grade to write it for the first time made me very happy but yeah it's i think the flood would have been better had it been a john boo movie yeah they could have gone bigger the stakes mm-hmm. would have been higher i think so more emotion more character beats i got an idea for you here let's close with something all right all right you're a producer right and i have i have we're stuck in an elevator and the ele- <laughs> like the elevate the power goes out and uh, during a flood and <laughs> we're in a high rise and we're stuck and i've got, i could pitch you uh ideas for high concept flicks and i have to approve one of them because we've become buds right yeah because um i end up figuring out a way out of the elevator and um and you're forever indebted to me and you you make a promise to make one of my ideas all right let's hear it all right uh first one um I, this is more of a crowd favorite. I know you you had the concept of um, <laughs> Squid Lake, but I'm gonna take it up a notch with Orca Lake, which it orcas in a Canadian lake. I'll move that to the, I'll move that to the next round. That's good. That's good. Okay, that's moving. Okay, all right. Next one, um, Nightmare on Elm Street, but not while people are sleeping. It's while they're in the metaverse. <laughs> That's like, too much. That's too like, much. It, it, but it's like, okay, you're in the virtual reality, and, it, and it's like a digital Freddy, and he stalks you in the metaverse. So you have no idea what's real, but you're addicted to this game, and you have to you have to navigate through the game to save other people from that, Freddy. That's not high concept anymore. That's lost. That's all right. <laughs> that lost feel, me. Like with technology, there's all these opportunities for these old horror movies to to get refreshed into the current day. Nightmare on Elm Street. Wait, Nightmare in Virtual Reality Elm Street. I guess if you said yeah. something like that. It's Nightmare on Elm Street, but he attacks you in virtual reality. Yeah, it's like Nightmare on Elm Street, like V2. <laughs> <laughs> something. It's a, I like Orca. I, I, I'm going to go with what I – so I think Orca Lake is a better, stronger idea for me. Okay. So I'm not going to move that on. All right, cool. All right. Top Gun, but with drone pilots. <laughs> Pushing <laughs> the limits of drones. 
So it's just handles and like. Doo, doo, yeah, doo, the doo. handles and they get really intense. They still play volleyball and go to bars and they'll ask for high fiving from like the console. And they're just playing video games. Yeah, but they're pushing the drones to the limit. But they're the most expensive drones ever made. And it's a high stakes world of of drone pilots. Yeah, pushing it to the limit. All right, well, I'll, I'll move that. I'll move that to the next one. <laughs> Because it's, it's just a lot silly. Of, well, it's a lot of sweating um, from the drone, but then you can cut back and forth between the video feed and what's actually happening. I picture like Mary Elizabeth Winstead in this movie for some reason. I don't know why. That's good. And Aaron Paul, because he already did a drone movie. There's another drone movie? Yeah, he, Eye in the Sky, he does. He's a drone pilot, but All not right, like this one. <laughs> this is right, about so, hotshot drone pilots. <laughs> All right, so I'm in Miami, and it feels like every other person now is in the crypto. So Wolf of Wall Street but with cryptocurrency um, scandals or like defrauding people with crypto, but like Wolf of Wall Street, like if somebody's really smart with crypto and they get carried away, they make all this money and then it all just comes crashing down. So like Scarface, but with crypto. <laughs> you know, that's a great, that's even better. Yeah, I was that... thinking Wolf of Wall, I was thinking like the New York um, dock broker types, but that could be an option too. Like there's gotta be, a, why is there no like crypto, um movies wall street but crypto like, yeah but greed could, yeah and it all comes crashing down but then I, there's a moral quandary because this isn't regulated yet so it's like you know am i following the rules am i not like there's a lot of i'm sticking with, room or in there. I'm sticking with orca lake because i just okay. that's so easy i have a poster in my head already okay uh all right channing tatum returns to his roots and step up but it's a tiktok tournament and he has to like beat all these kids and get the most views on his tiktok dances how long are TikTok videos? Uh, between 30 seconds to a minute. Well, depends. If, like, if it's a dance, it's, like, no more than 30 seconds. So he's got to, like, go really hard, really fast. Step up TikTok? And then, like, it's <laughs> it's the, the clock is ticking? Yeah, and wait, like, the clock is all these ticking, kids. but it's T-I-K. Step up, the clock is ticking. And he has to reclaim his TikTok throne from a bunch of TikTok kids? Yeah, because, well, the first one is, like, he meets the, the girl from the, the classical academy... Uh, he's the guy from the street that dances hip hop and, and you know more more urban and then but now it's everything's online everything's about like these like you make millions of dollars for these freaking TikTok videos of you dancing. All right, yeah, that's a good one. All right, we'll move that forward. All right, I see it. Uh, the next one is um, I, I tried to like fit as many phobias as I could in one movie. So my original idea was like hot air blimp with with clowns, like because you. <laughs> clown blimp but because you're in the air and it's dark and there's clowns but then I'm, instead i'm just gonna go clown cruise it, it's like you're on a cruise and there's a clown convention but they're just evil clowns but because then you got water you could have heights because you could be dangling at the edge of the cruise ship you could have tight spaces where you're crawling around in the belly of the of the ship do they become zombies and you got clowns there's an actual phobia about clowns like they no they're not zombie clowns clown cruise Zom but an infection breaks out and then when everyone's dressed as clowns they all get infected and attack or just are you talking like clowns just there's creepy clown creepy ass clowns on a cruise ship <sighs> and then there's other good clowns it's a good question i haven't thought that far i'm thinking about like claustrophobia dark what's well, like can have ghost fights. ship but cr cl but with clowns yeah all right so the three it's a lot to work with there the three i, I mean, like it's... all right like okay. work a lake i like tiktok clock is ticking step up the clock is ticking and then i like clown cruise <sighs> can, can we do a poll on uh let's do a poll on movies films and flicks to see what the uh the mass is like yeah i i like these i would go man i feel like i could sell the heck out of the clock is ticking but the problem is i don't like i don't like making movies about what's popular now because this won't come out for a year so who knows what's happened in a year so i never and that would date our movie as well so I think, dude, you could you could crank out a TikTok dance. You know, people would would like kill to be a part of that. Yeah, I just I don't like. It's it. as low budget too because everyone's producing their own content. Yeah, but as a producer, man, I don't like hitting on what's popular. Remember when everyone made VR movies and hacker movies in the nineties? <laughs> <laughs> All right, or, so I'm I'm moving to Orca Lake or I'm moving to Clown Cruise. Okay, <sighs> let's put it for a poll. Can we do that? Yeah, but I want to pick Orca Lake Clown Cruise. Clown Cruise flows off the tip of my tongue quicker. And then they'll be like, what's it about? There's a cruise ship. There's killer clowns. Orca Lake. It's a lake in Canada. There's orcas. But it's like a Lake Placid with orcas. But like orcas like 
I don't know. They're not. But you'd that, have to explain. They're not that scary looking. You yeah, but you'd have to explain. Are they good? Why they're evil? Is it like yeah. a free willy? Is it like a free willy in a lake? There's a lot of explaining there, so I'm going with Clown Cruise. Okay. <laughs> I'm just a producer, man. I mean, any of these ideas would work, but I'm going Clown Cruise. I'm green lighting Clown because Terrifier, Smile, all those movies are big. It Clown Cruise, Jet Skis. <laughs> I put Jet Skis in there. I'd have a lazy river on the boat, and I would have a jet ski chase. Oh man, like Clown Cruise. It, it's evenly it, – I mean it kind of rolls off your tongue. You know exactly what it's about. There's not much – so it's Orca – like Orca Lake, Orcas in Canada attack. That's a lot. But if you say clown cruise, evil clowns on a cruise, sold. I'm thinking high – I'm high concept. All right, go right to But screen. like step up on TikTok. I mean that's uh that's quick. Yeah, that's I just like – quick... I don't like investing in current modern technology. I'm, <laughs> I've gone full producer. I mean, you, okay. Because like, you know, I love that movie Chef. But then on that movie, he's, like, tweeting and doing all that stuff, and you're like, oh. Like, I love Chef, but the whole tweeting subplot on it. Oh, but, his, but that's, how he, that's how he bonded with his son, though. And that's how he got his son involved in the No, it's really smart, business. but I just don't like it when that type, like, Facebook and MySpace yeah. and all that's in movies. I don't like it. You're right, because when that came out, tweeting had been around for, like, ten years already. So, yeah, I don't – I'm not, I'm not TikToking. I'm, I'm clown cruising. Okay. Just, I, I have a poster in my brain right now. That's it. Like, I see it. I have the trailer cut already in my head. I have a cast. This movie's cast. Who's it's your done. cast in Clown Cruise? Oh, man. So pretty much – so in my head, you have this clown convention. You want to keep it young. You want to keep it fresh. So I'm just going to – It's like a college age. I'm just going to have uh, the entire cast. cast of Euphoria. Have Zendaya be the hero. Everyone else are clowns. That's it. <laughs> okay. That's it. The, the entire cast of Euphoria on a boat learning clown skills. <laughs> And then there's evil clowns. Like, how mad should you be? You invested all this money on a vacation, and you get on a cruise, and there's a bunch of clowns running around? <laughs> Slaughtering people? <laughs> like, what the hell? Why would they? You should tell people if you're going to have a clown convention on a cruise. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. This I, would, I, I, I would walk right off the cruise ship. Wait. Like, I would not. You'll laugh until you cry. <laughs> oh, man. Those tears aren't because of laughter. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> there's so many ways you could go with this. Yeah, clown gets punched in the nose and you hear, yep. Oh man, enjoy this conversation. This was a good one. All right, so this was this was great, man. Thank you so much for joining me. I know we yeah, I know man. we went after it a little bit, but I mean it's hard rain. People know what hard rain is. Well, they may not. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> because it came and went, and and if you are listening, uh, HBO Max is streaming. Uh, you know, let us know what you think about it. Technically, it's very impressive. Yeah, so we'll, we'll stick with that. But this was great, Eric. Thanks for joining me, man. Yeah, that was awesome. See you, man. All right, so uh, for me, Mark Hoffmeyer, and for Eric Hoffmeyer, this is Movies on the Flicks. We'll see you next week.